are now live. Begin. We're telling your followers that you've started a live video. And I think there's probably some people that can see already. Just tell me when some people file in. One person is in. Two. Five. Hey everybody. Sixteen. It's a beautiful sunny Sunday afternoon here in northern Wisconsin. It's still a little cold. Owen Thomas, Sean Hellman, my mom. <laughs> hey Owen and Sean and Maureen. Mary. Mary from Massachusetts? No, Mary from... Oh, Mary Tripoli. Yeah. Uh -huh. There's a lot of Marys. Hey everybody. Um, so I'm just going to get started because there's other people that are going to probably file in and there's no sense in waiting. Um, thanks for tuning in. I hope everybody's doing good. Uh, let's go into the lathe room and talk about the pole lathe first. This, this uh, little dive thing is going to be about turning on a western electric lathe, but I want to connect it all to the historical lathes and um, what this is all about for me. Um, so let's go in, in the other room here. And if anybody has any questions, just holler. Jasmine's uh, running the camera and she'll do her best to, uh, to uh, vet those questions. We won't be able to answer all of them, but, but go ahead and try and, and hopefully I can answer some. Um, but what I'm going to be turning today is some of these classic, uh, what I see as classic ale bowls. Uh, inspired by uh, Nordic or Scandinavian uh, drinking vessels. So there's a lot of history about these. Um, in, the, in the olden days, you know, the, the es ecstasy from being drunk was thought to, be, to, to bring you closer to the gods uh, or the spirit world. And so uh, drinking was a, a very, had a very special place in people's um, daily lives or at least ceremonial lives and these bowls were part of that um, as with many different drinking vessels around the world but with these bowls this this truncated shape uh, allows for you to to you know put your lip in a comfy spot and also that that curled in shape um, you see that in early Stone Age pot pottery this sunken in or truncated rim that uh, allows the when you're moving with liquid in it the the liquid will splash back inside the bowl instead of an open form bowl where the uh, liquid will go sloshing out so that's part of the shape is, is born from uh, utilitarian uh, needs to keep the ale in the bowl especially after you've had a few sips i would imagine <laughs> um, so we have uh, the pole lathe, and I know some of you know this pretty well, um, but for those who don't, uh, I've been turning on one of these for well over 10 years, but primarily 8 years. And this lathe is uh, uh, a European version of an early lathe probably from the near far east, uh, and that earlier lathes were uh, uh, evolved from bow lathes. So there's a strap lathe that there was a drive shaft of wood and you, uh, one person ran a, a strap around it and it was in two pillow block bearings and everybody, you know, the, the turner and assistant were on the ground and uh, it's one of the earliest lathes along with the bow lathe. And that stuff spread from the Near Far East all over the world. And in Europe, the, uh, I think the habit of working standing upright has to do with the climate. But anyway, you see workbenches and lathes and all this stuff, people start standing. Whereas in the Near, the near Far East and the Far East, uh, people are still sitting, working from sitting position mostly, or kneeling. And I don't know why that is, but I think it's because of the climate, I think, but who knows for sure. This is all speculative because uh, there's no real documented history of this kind of stuff. It kind of fell to the wayside. 
There's some books that are in Germany that I might try to find someday that talk about early history, but it's sort of lost. Um, so anyway, we have the European olathe, which is a descendant of that strap lathe, and um, you have the spring and the foot pedal, and you have two centers, headstock, tailstock, or poppets as they're called, and when you when you uh, want to turn a bowl in particular, not chair legs, that's like spindle work. That's a whole different setup. Uh, a bowl turning is 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 a little different. You'd have a mass of wood. You'd hammer the mandrel in, and then drive strap. Instead of that assistant, one person can operate, and as you push down, the spring returns it, and the bowl spins back and forth. Um, next week, on Sunday, I'll do some pole turning at three, same time. Um, so we moved to my, my Japanese style lathe. <clears throat> So these are descendants of that strap lathe in a more direct way. Um, the technique of turning when you have uh, a shaft with some spikes on it. So if you can imagine a, a, a giant mandrel spinning back and forth, and then you'd hammer your bow blade onto it, but there wouldn't be a tail stock at all. Just uh, your workpiece suspended on two bearings, wooden bearings at the earlier times. So it's going back and forth and because of the assistant driving the strap, you have power on both directions. Unlike the pole lathe, the return spring it doesn't have enough power to make a real strong cut. You can do it a little bit for special cuts, but other than that, it's not, um, it's not used for primary cutting, it's the downward cut. But the Asian lathes were driven with power in both directions. And there's a bunch of different versions in China and Japan and, and Korea. <clears throat> um, but the, the, the modern electric lathe is almost directly tied to that, where you have a lathe, there's a motor inside here. Um, but the technique is still tied to that strap lathe where you can cut when it's coming toward you, even though it's moving in one direction. Uh, you can cut when it's cutting toward you, or you could switch the motor's direction with a complicated belting system, or today we have modern uh, electronics that can switch direction with the flip of a switch. Um, and when it's turning in the other direction, you can use the hook across center over here um, because there's no tail stock. So the Asian, this, this modern uh, Japanese lathe is directly descended to that early strap lathe, probably more so than this, um, in my opinion. And so I started using these. But both these tools or machines use uh, hooks. Um, and there, there's a wide variety of, of different hooks. I don't know if you can zoom in on that or not. Um. I think if you put it on a background, yeah. yeah, there we go. So on the right here is, you know, what we see as a, a Western European style hook for pole lathe turning. And then the one on the left is what I've noticed uh, to be, they're, they're common in Japan. They use some rounded hooks too, but a lot of times they have this uh, very tight radius right here that, that they use to cut. Similar to our Western hooks, we, we cut in certain areas like that too. Um, so anyway, there's a whole thing I could do on just hook tools, but. I'm gonna clean the, the lens for a second here, so watch out, people. <laughs> Whoops. Sorry about that. So clean. anyway, that's, looks, well, looks okay. Ish. <laughs> so that's, that's the kind of the backdrop. And so I've been using these two lathes for the past, well, this one for about two years. I went to Japan a couple times. Was it last week or two weekends ago? I did the thing on last, last week. Last I did Sunday. Yep. We'll probably do another one of those because we weren't able to record it. Um, but anyway, enough on that. So we're going to move into the other room and turn on a Western lathe.
Western electric blade, I should say. So this is in my production. You know, I employ uh, an assistant, uh, Joey Trainer, Great Lakes Woodworks, I think. Give him a follow. Um, but we do a lot of prep work in this room where we bandsaw, uh, preparing plate blanks, bowl blanks. It's still mostly green woodworking. We store wood in, in garbage cans up to a week. Uh, otherwise, things are staged outside. Um, some stuff uh, that I turn, I'm moving to a little bit more dry wood turning because it's a little bit more predictable, better finish, and it's more economical for the materials that I'm gathering in large quantities. I can prep that stuff and get it uh, roughed out and so I can dry it and not have to worry about keeping it, keeping it green. There was a time where I was like, all right, I'm gonna build a walk-in freezer in my basement to keep the wood green. And then I kind of had a realization that that was just an absurd idea and that I should do what everybody else has learned to do, which is just turn some dry wood too. And so I'll work with any type of wood. Um, so I got this Western lathe. Uh, it's a, a Harvey, which is kind of a new company on the market. It's pretty cool. It's an undersized for production work, but it, it's what I could afford. And so we do all the prep work. Joey's roughing out cups for me on this lathe. Uh, and then I do the finish work on the Japanese lathe for end grain. And so the the Japanese lathe really works great for end grain, and the, what I've found is the tangential wood uh, bowls uh, work to, to turn, uh, turn those on the western lathe. Of course, the pole lathe too works pretty good, but um, I'm slowly using the pole lathe only for teaching techniques on hook tools give you a solid foundation, a hook tool technique, so then you can take those hooks to uh, an electric machine if need be. And, uh, and of course, turning handled cups on a pole lathe is kind of the only way you can do a handled vessel. And so I still use the pole lathe for that. So, uh, I'm pretty new to the uh, Western electric lathe, and I'm new to these tools, uh, which, are, which are gouges, um, bowl gouges, and there's lots of different kinds. And I did a lot of research and um, kind of settled in on what they call the 40-40 grind, which is a, a little bit like, I guess, the Irish grind, if you know what that is. But again, I don't claim to know much um, about the different grinds and how they work. I do have a lot of experience turning, and I understand the, the cutting geometries and stuff on these tools. Um, but uh, I don't know a lot about the differences that much, so don't ask me any questions about that. I won't be able to answer. Um, so, I'm just going to get to turning, and maybe Jasmine will want to come over over here. See if I can't tempt Owen to buy an electric motor. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding, Owen. All right, so for those that don't have any experience with this, um, you know, we got a four jaw chuck here and there's a screw that you put into the chuck and then you drill a hole. And so then you can mount, you can mount your bowl on that screw, kind of like a mandrel on a pole lathe. My indexer is a little bit. All right. And then we have a different style two rest in the pole lathe. There's a lot to think about with this <coughs> machine, but um, having this set up a little bit below center for the type of gouge and the techniques I use works best. There's, there's, a, there's a lot of different nuances with those tools, just like hooks. Question, mm -hmm. why is the Japanese lathe more suitable for end grain than the Western style electric lathe? Because 
the hook design. It's hard to get a hook to come from bottom of bowl in uh, toward the rim. We have to cut from bottom to rim uh, with side drain. Now end drain is different because you're getting sh just incredible shearing cuts. Very efficient. It's just like turning spindle. And so with those hooks, you can get a really sweet cut efficiently on end grain, but on side grain, you have this end grain exposed right here, right here, then not so much here, then here again. And it's hard to get a tool, a hook in particular, at those higher speeds to cut um, efficiently. Now you can do it, but it takes, um, it takes a lot of time. And so for me, the pole lathe is obviously the slowest, even though I can turn quite fast on a pole lathe. I've been doing it long enough. Japanese lathe is still faster than the pole lathe. So for me, you know, it's, 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 it's an acceptable uh, adaptation. But when it comes to efficiency of these bowl gouges and side grain are, are, are by far the best. There's just no argument about it. Um, Again, though, you have an electric motor, it's an expensive tool, Japanese lathe you can just build yourself with a drive shaft and a motor, and of course the pole lathe, you know, costs you like 10 bucks to build if you're clever. So it's all just a matter of scale, too. Um, for my line of work, this is a more efficient machine than the other two. I need to make money. So... I'm gonna fire this up. This lathe is uh, uh, really quiet. And I'm gonna be turning uh, below 1,000 RPMs. It's been said that anything above 1,000 will go airborne. Anything below 1,000 will drop if it comes loose. It shouldn't come loose, but. And then I have this swept back uh, bowl gouge. Setting it up so that I'm skewing as across from the bottom of the bowl. Now, as I clear that, I'm gonna to have to put this on. Put my tailstock in after I flattened it for safety. And maybe you can. I have that evened out. I'll switch over to the side and get that leveled out. And the reason why I like the 4040 is it's push cuts. I understand that motion because the pole lathe is pivot cuts and it's, it's similar to me. Familiar, but you can see it's really shearing nicely, and I can keep this under control with just one hand. Do the left hand turning there just to get the rim. So I've evened it out, it's balanced now, so I can crank up the speed a little bit to a thousand, because right now I'm not, I'm not quite at, at a thousand. Now get a little bit of better finish, a little bit faster. So here is not a, pu a push cut, but a pull cut, but with this type of grind, you have to have that slope.
And with this type of turning, the tool rest location is really important. You can't have it too far away because there's flex in this tool. So I'm already thinking about the shape, but I got this bark I have to get rid of. And then later I'm going to turn it around, so I'm going to need to put a tenon on the bottom of this. Which I'll cut off later. Can you see the time, Jasmine, or no? Uh, no, I cannot. Okay. So foot, let's see your elbow. Do you have your phone here? Nope. Is Matt, is Matt on? Yeah. <laughs> Ruben says it's 20 past. 20 Adrian, past. yeah. Okay. 9.20 in UK, yeah, Adrian okay. said. Well, as long as we know the minute. <laughs> right, know, right. Okay. Oh, thanks, Ost Handmade. He Oops. said press on the red sign on the top live to see the time. Awesome. Was he the guy gave yeah, he gave us advice last time. time. <laughs> Thank you. We know these types of machines, but not the uh, technical ones. Okay, Liam Culbertson says, is your design determined in advance, or do you improvise as you go? Um, I have a pretty clear vision that, you know, it's going to be something like this. So I know that it's going to have a, a, a sunken in rim. It, the rim is going to be concave because it just looks better, or that's the style I like. The location at which the transition happens um, I have a rough idea. Well, I would say more than rough. But um, so it's a little bit of improv, but mostly planning, if that makes sense. Right now, I have to take this bark, I have to get this bark down. So, because wood turning is like carving, it's reductive, you know, every cut changes the possibility of what the outcome will be. So, you have to be thoughtful. So now I'm going to shape, shape the thing. Getting that tenon a little smaller so I don't have to carve it all off later. And then the foot, making that a little bit smaller. And then I'm going to cut in the rim a little bit. So I have this rough shape, the transition point, and then the little bit of rim that I like to put on my uh, bowls and the foot. So at this point, I'm going to decide <coughs> what it is I'm going to do. Um, and it looks like I'm going to change this area a little bit here, maybe make the foot a little bit smaller and smooth this out and then, and then fine tune the, this. This spot. Adrian had a question there. Part the tenon off rather than carve it. Um, yeah, uh, lay, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna carve it off with the hook with the with the gouge. That's what I meant. I still think of this as carving. I won't <laughs> part it off because it's side grain, but I'm gonna turn it off. 
So the beauty of this lathe in particular is I can swing that out any any place up to up to 90. So this is really sweet for hollowing because it's a short, kind of a short bed, and I don't have to with the push cut the tailstock gets in the way. I was been pulling a little bit, but that's not the where this tool shines, this grind shines. Yeah, you get the push. So I do a little bit of a pull. I have the tool drop so that I could get a nice skew. But then from here on out. shape needs to be a little bit not quite as fair as I'd like it so I'm not watching my tool I'm watching the shape over here and because you know I've born into this on the pole lathe um, I don't mind tool marks I think they actually add a lot of beauty so I'm not worried about any of the undulations or anything. Just like nice pottery, there's there's marks left by the hand. And so that's fine. Just as long as it's fair and not lumpy. Are you able to get the? Are you able to get good good shots from that? I think so. Yeah. Okay, okay uh, and then there's there a couple questions. You can shoot here. Uh, let's questions? see. Can you make your bowls as thin on this lathe as on a pole lathe? Uh, I can if I slow the speed down and I'm very careful. But I tend to make them a little thicker. I'll talk about that when I hollow. Who asked that, Mary? Uh, Liam Culbertson. Uh -huh. You can make quite thin bowls. You just have to support. You have to support it in a different way than the slow speed, uh, slow speed uh, bowl lathe. So I got the shape I want. Oops. I'm gonna leave a little extra on the rim. I'll take that off later. Mary asked if you did electric turning before. No, I didn't. Um, I turned one bowl in like high school, no, grade uh, middle school. It was a really bad experience. Because it's just like, <laughs> here's the dry maple, put the face plate on. He like basically showed me a couple things for like 10 minutes and then left. <laughs> and I just scraped away and caught my tool and just sawdust. It was horrible. Um, and so when I got into carving spoons and stuff, I wanted to make bowls. And I had this old lathe um, with Babbitt bearings and these old drip oilers and stuff. And I was going to rebuild it. Um, and I was remembering those experiences. And I had some some tools, but I, this is almost before internet, so there was not a lot of information besides books, which I wasn't interested in buying any at the time. So I just kind of gave up on it and got the pull lathe. And then uh, at that time, then Robin was, was posting a lot on, on at least images of turning on the pull lathe and kind of figured it out from there. But um, 
the hook tools is, is, I think, the solid foundation for any type of turning. It really gets you thinking about how the edge works, regardless on the orientation of the handle to the edge. It really helps you to understand what shearing is and the two parts. There's two parts to a cut. There's always a shear and there's always uh, a slice. And depending on what your tool is and, and how you're approaching your wood and the wood shape, uh, you're trying to maintain both of those at, at, different, at different times. Um, so, yeah, anyway. Okay. So I even that out a little bit. I'm going to try to trim that rim down just a little bit. Okay. Now for the hollowing. So this, this grind doesn't hollow as good as a regular bowl gouge uh, following this curve. It, it goes best straight in. The wing is shearing. Shearing the wood. So you can see I'm just pushing it straight in. is because I have health uh, physical problems from turning on the pole for too many years. And I don't know if it's because I gained weight or it just takes its toll. A little bit of both. But as I get older, you know, I want to have a more comfortable life too. and make some money. <laughs> yeah, you're standing in the spot. <laughs> so here's a, a cool tool that um, a friend of mine made me. He's a blacksmith. But uh, the, the tool design they use in Japan for, for b bottoming the depth uh, of your bowls. So this wouldn't work on a pole lathe because the mandrel's in the way. But you can set that depth up and then you can drill a hole real quick. I'm still working on getting the angle just right. But you can drill a hole and then I know where I need to go. That's just as they use it in Japan, mostly on end rails. So I can see that. I don't have to measure anymore. So one more pass with the 40 40. Oh. With the 40 40. That scare you? Adrian has a comment. If yeah. you added a secondary bevel at the bottom of your grind, it would allow an easier bottoming cut. I have those hooks. I don't know if you've done that yeah, already. Yeah, I have those hooks. As far as I understand, this 40-40 grind, it's, it has to do with the 40 degree angle here, and uh, the wing is 40 
that bevels 40, and it's constant. It doesn't change. So it's not as versatile on the bottom, so I use a regular bottoming gouge, and I do, do, uh, I, I do grind back the bevel. But this just eats that grain, and it's simpler cut than having to swing. So then I switch over to um, a regular a bull gouge convention. is green and it's drying so I want to do the rim right now before the bowl warps because it'll warp a little bit and I'm going to take my smaller uh, gouge the diameter it's still ground to the 40 40 and get that rim nice You can always grab a little bit of the, if you're going really thin, the bowl starts to warp under the pressure of the tool, so you can grab some shavings and push against the bowl. With that push cut and the 40-40, it's quite easy to control with one hand. Two questions. Yeah. Ruben Gobi wants to know, if it would ever make sense to forge your own bowl gouges. And Mary wants to know if you ever do bark up bowls. No bark up bowls. I don't like, I don't like the look. And uh, I don't know, man. Forging your own gouge would be pretty complicated because most of the, the work would be um, slitting, slitting and drifting that open. Um, you know, you could do it, but, you know, and then you want, yeah, you want to, to machine it nice and smooth because the nature of these gouges is a lot of sliding. And so if this surface is rough, it's going to be really hard to slide, slide the tools in their kind of swinging, sliding motions. Unlike a, a hook, it's all pivot, um, pivoting and cutting and, and twisting. So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, this is like 60 bucks, and it's high-speed steel. So uh, the answer would be no. <laughs> <laughs> and then someone else asked if you would use traditional-style hook tools with the electric lathe. I can, yeah. I was just going to show some. And items. whether the variable speed would help. The problem with hooks is not a problem. It's just they, they, the edge geometry and the speeds we're dealing with, the edges I find too fine. Uh, you know, 40, 45 degree edge geometry is what shears that wood out as it's spinning at these higher speeds on the electric lathe. It's kind of like a chip breaker on a, 
on a hand plane. And so without a chip breaker, you're gonna get torn fibers and things like that. So it's harder to get the hooks designed nicely for side grain turning. Uh, end grain turning is a whole different, whole different thing and hooks work great um, on end grain. Um, so now I'm gonna set up and do these long pivot cuts. I'm going to turn the speed down a little bit, but you wouldn't want to... If you don't know how to use hooks on the pole lathe, um, don't try it on an electric lathe. That's kind of how I, I talk about it. There's too much risk. Break a hook, this broken piece goes flying in your eye, you catch, the bowl explodes. It's very dangerous. Um, so uh, I don't advocate for it. I, I show people like now, but I, I hope you don't copy me, because if you catch, you, it's going to be bad. So learn on a pole lathe. So I can I can do the inside. It's the same motion as pole lathe turning. Um, but you have to get your tool set up with the right angles, um, uh, slope and stuff of the taper. But there's kind of no need. Sometimes it's nice at the bottom of the bowl to use a hook because the gouges have a limit at the bottom. Vila Sundqvist, the you know the grandfather of spoon carving, he was also a bowl turner. And he talks a lot about that in his book. Let's get this nice like, drop, a drop hook. swinging motion with this and it's sliding on the tool rest. Um, with a hook I could just be in one point and then swing up and to the center. But the edge geometry is a little bit funky um, with each hook and each bullet shape. Forty-three minutes. Okay. So just a little bit thick. Yeah. And there's some nice figure in there. jam chucks um, and so you could push this against with your tailstock and turn the bottom off but um, you don't even need that the green one I think has a little bit of a grip to it So, there we go. If 
it spins, it'll make a little mark, but maybe you want to be over here. Yeah, yeah, it was spraying against the wall. <laughs> so the other thing, you know, being a pulley turner first, you know, I can deal with this just by by uh, taking my axe to it. Because I can. So that's a nice hail bowl. I might have changed some things a little bit, but, you know, you win some, you lose some. All right. Um, that's probably it. I thought maybe we'd have time to do another one, but um, um, we don't. So if there's any last minute questions. We'll wait, we'll wait for a couple minutes yeah. for questions and then. I'll field some questions. Otherwise, um, oh, announcements. Don't, don't forget that Every Sunday at 3, I'm going to do something for who knows how long, and uh, probably for a couple months. And then uh, Thursday night, unfortunately for the UK folks, it's, it's at 7 p.m. Central Time. So I'm going to be doing a, a slideshow presentation, sort of a webinar, uh, through North House Folk Schools. Uh, it's going to be a Zoom uh, webinar. And you can go to their website. I'll put a link up somewhere and promote it. You just have to log in and get on this presentation. I'll do a photo slideshow of my travels or our travels to Japan. Talk about wood turning and the wood culture uh, stuff that I discovered over there. And that's Thursday at 7. And what else? Uh, we're having a big Arushi sale. It's not that big, but uh, some of our stuff will be up for grabs May 9th. I'm not sure what time we're going to open it up. Stay tuned for that. Always subscribe to the newsletter to get the heads up. It's the best way. And then, um, uh, yeah, we have a donate button on the website. So if you like what you see here and you think it's worth something, you know, hit the donate button. Any questions? Um, how are your ears? I think they look good. <laughs> <laughs> I think it had to do with sound yeah, yeah. noise. Uh, I'm, I, I'm fine. I have a, a little bit of hearing loss, but it's from using chainsaws and circular saws in my carpentry days. Uh, not so much from turning. Um, it's pretty quiet. It probably sounds louder on the phone than it is in real life. What wood do you prefer to turn? Um, I like birch. It's probably my favorite, what I can get here in northern Wisconsin. But uh, lately I've been turning a lot of silver maple. What wood is that? This is silver maple. Okay. Somebody because asked. I can get these large diameter uh, silver maple trees. And, um, uh, you know, I bought basically a, a semi load of it last spring and we're just finishing it up right now. Um, so I buy thousand dollars worth of wood, big diameter so that I can leave it sit and it doesn't rot right away and I can mill it down, process it down. And even in a, in a, a four inch timber, it'll stay relatively moist for almost a year. And so anyways, uh, silver maples kind of my go-to these days. I think that James River Sloyd is Logan. Is that? Yeah, that's Logan. He said he misses us. <laughs> <laughs> Logan. 
Maybe we'll see you in New York. We, we're talking about going to Pat's. If, if Pat's thing is still on in June or July, we might we might escape out of Wisconsin and, and yeah. uh, drive out there, but we'll see. And then Matt from Tokyo says, is this your normal process or just for the Instagram demo? It is my normal process, Matt, uh, for turning these bowls, yes. And Nick wants to know, am, I am curious how you do those finishing cuts on the outside of the bowl, i.e. geometry of the bowl gouge. Mm. I can show you. I hear a chainsaw outside. <laughs> you know what that means. <laughs> Those that are woodworkers are like pee, perking up. <laughs> And then someone else asked, what's the next step with this particular bowl? So. Uh, after this, let it dry and then uh, paint the outside in oil or just, just oil. So for the, for the uh, if you want to come in close, with this, this grind in particular, um, at, the, at the foot, I'm coming in. Uh, parallel the, the 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 bottom of the gouge coming in parallel to the to the axis to cut in and then you need an, a little bit of an angle drop the camera down like that you need a little bit of an angle you need this angle to skew so I skew a little bit okay then I'll come back I can't unhook it from the you know, if this was mounted in regularly, you know, I took the... Then you come across, you know, kind of tipped up a little bit, but you're like, you're carving like that. So you're slicing, you're slicing along the bowl and you're shearing along the ledge. You know, so depending on your grind, you're going to have to figure out where that is. And that's the same with the hook. Yeah, we're at 52 minutes. Our, our, our um, consultant said save it before the time runs out. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> Last time uh, we didn't save it. So uh, that's it. Thanks, everybody. I hope everybody's, everybody's doing good. And uh, it would be really great to get together sometime. I'm itchy to get out of here. Uh, but until then, we'll see you. We'll see you later. Hope everybody's doing good. Bye.